Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Steve Adam. I'm one of the trustees and I'm the treasurer of Keswick Ministries. It's my great privilege to welcome you here this morning and to give you a very warm welcome. And I hope it won't be too warm uh, a welcome. Um, we're delighted to have Niv Lobo with us uh, and he's going to be looking at a series on under the theme of being grateful, which is a the theme, of course, of the whole convention, uh, being grateful for past battles. So a rather enigmatic title, which Liv will no doubt uh, explore as we go through the week. So if that's what you've come to hear, you're in the right place. If you think you're coming to something else, then you're in the wrong place and you might need to go and find uh, where you're meant to be going. Anyway, I'm going to hand over to Niv very shortly, but let me just pray for him as we start this time together. Father, we thank you that you are a great and wonderful God. Father, we thank you that you're the God who put creation in place, who holds it together by your powerful word. And yet at the same time, you're the God who calls us dearly loved children, who welcomes us into your presence, who wants us to call you Father, Abba, Father, who delights to give us every good gift. And Father, we thank you and praise you for that relationship we have with you through the Lord Jesus and all that he has done for us on Calvary's cross. So Father, we ask for your blessing on this morning's seminar. We pray for uh, Niv as he uh, brings it to us, as he explores some of these past battles that Christians have fought. And uh, we just thank you for that. And we thank you for your truth uh, contained in your word, your living word. And so we ask your blessing on us now. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Over to you. Thanks so much, Stuart. It's lovely to be with you all and uh, delight to meet you. My name's Niv. I'm normally based in Southampton where I'm uh, a curate at a church, if that means anything to you. Uh, I work for a church if it doesn't. Um, and I'm also, like I hope all of us in this room, I'm an amateur theologian. I love thinking about the truth of God's word and trying to unpack the riches of the Bible um, because, of course, we are called to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, as Matthew puts it. And so to love God with mind is a really important thing. And one of the things I'm praying for these sessions, if you stick around, is that you will love the Lord your God um, that bit more with your mind, and that that would flow out into loving him that bit more with your heart, soul, and strength as well. So as Stuart said, we're thinking about being grateful for past battles. I don't mean physical battles, wars, swords, etc. So if you want a Christian theology of war, we can talk about it another time. I'm thinking rather about those battles for truth which Christians have fought in the past, which have set us in such a good um, stead and given us so much as Christians to rejoice in when we read the Bible and think about the challenges that come to us outside. Just a few things as we go through. We'll have some slides no need to obsess over those. They're just an outline for us as we go through. And also there is a kind of quotation sheet, not a paper copy, sadly, but you can find it on the internet. If you go to the Keswick Convention website, click through to the seminar stream, under a picture with a little description of these sessions, it'll say quotations handout. Do feel free to download that. Again, that's not at all ne a necessary thing, but what it will do is just give you a little bit more um, of, of the stuff I'm talking about. And if at any point you think, well, that sounded interesting, uh, well, you can just dig in a little bit more and, and look at the quotes. Um, I, my wife is always frustrated by how much I spend on books. And so in a funny way, I could be recommending all these books to you. What I've tried to do instead is pick thinkers whose work is largely free on the internet. So apologies to 10 of those and all the good work they do. But my hope is, if you're interested in finding out more, you can do that quite easily by getting out onto the internet and uh, pursuing some of this stuff. You can find it for free. Sometimes the translation's a bit 19th century, but that's still a wonderful thing to look at. A few more preliminary thoughts. It's such a joy to be with you. I found it quite frustrating preparing all of this stuff because the truth is every one of the sessions we're looking at could be a whole seminar track, could be weeks worth of teaching. And so this week, I'm really giving you sips but my hope and prayer is that having had them, you might want to take a swim. You might want to really jump into some of these things and think through them for yourself. Really pray that will happen. Can I say that's actually quite good news, either way you look at it. Because if you're here and you're enjoying it, that means there is lots more where this came from. And if you're here and you're terribly bored, you can be grateful that I haven't said everything there is to be said. 
Um, so that's just something to be thinking about. Now, as I say, we're going to be looking over these next four seminars at a little bit of how over the first few centuries of the church, really the first four or five, God raised people up to defend his truth against certain kinds of threats. We could not do without the work that they did under God. And it's a real treasure for us. And I'm praying that as we unpack it, we'll rejoice together. And we'll know the scriptures better too, even though we won't spend lots of time exegeting lots of passages. But the angle we're taking on all of that, as Stuart mentioned, is the battles, the struggles for truth that happened in the past. Seeing how various twisted versions of creation, for instance, in this topic encourage Christians to think through what the Bible actually said. This is something that, in God's providence, seems to have been a real gift to the church. These bits of false teaching, and we'll think about the technical name for them in a moment, were a bit like the grit in the oyster that became in time an amazing pearl of Christian reflection on the truth. That's my prayer that this, this seminar track, we get to look at some of those pearls. But we've already prayed, and I'd like to begin with John 1, 1 to 18. If you have the next slide, I haven't put the reading up, because I would love to encourage you to use your paper Bibles if you've got them. What a thing to have the Bible in your own language, in your hands. So if you've got one, do grab it. If you've got one on your phone, that's good too. Maybe not as good for reasons that we'll see today. But anyway, John chapter 1. Verses 1 to 18. As I say, I'm not going to exegete this passage. I would love to. Don't, don't want to take all your time. Um, but, but I think this passage has been so fruitful for Christians as they've reflected. And it will help us to think through big things. Oh, one more thing. I would like to leave some time for questions at the end. Maybe roughly about 10 minutes. So be thinking of your questions. I can't promise the best answers you'll ever hear. Perhaps you can't promise answers. But I'll do my best. Anyway, God's holy word, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent or of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Do, by the way, have that in your heads all through this seminar track, because those 18 verses proved so important for pretty well everything we're looking at this week in this seminar track. So if at any point you're thinking, hmm, where's this from in the Bible? More than likely, John chapter 1 will be saying a bit about it. Okay. So before every session gets going properly, I want to begin each one with a fact about how Christians have fought these past battles. Can I have the next slide, please? And here is my first fact. Christians were battling for primary truths. The four things we're thinking about uh, this week were not secondary issues. They were not areas in which Christians can go wrong, and that's okay. They're areas of what Paul calls in 1 Corinthians 15, things of first importance. So we're talking about people battling for primary truths. They're battling against what comes to be known as heresy. 
The word heresy comes from the Greek word meaning to choose because in time, Christians said, these heretics, those who were clinging to these errors, were choosing to go a different way from what the Bible taught and what the church held to. Now, I used to work with students in Christian unions, and I loved it. But one of the things that was particularly precious about that was seeing Christians from very different churches gather together to be on mission together. Amazing. One of the downsides of that was the friendly banter between different kinds of churches that at times reflected the worst of our prejudices. And one of the things I hated is when Christians would call other Christians who disagreed with them heretics. Usually friendly, sometimes not. But, you know, if you disagree with what I think about the Holy Spirit, heretic. If you disagree with what I think about um, the role of women in church, heretic. And that is unacceptable. I always hated when people said that. Because heresy is not just being wrong about something. It's very specific. Heresies were things that were specifically condemned by the church as unacceptable as needing to be excluded so that people could believe in Jesus at all. So it's very wrong to call something a heresy when it's just a mistake. Heresy is much more specific than that. Here's a worked example. I have a three-month-old daughter called Maria, and I'm very, very excited to bring her for baptism in church, as I believe the scriptures teach. But if my wife and I went to a Baptist church, we couldn't do that, because that's not what Baptist churches believe the scriptures teach. Now, one of us is wrong on that, but whoever it is, neither of us is a heretic. That question of who gets baptized when is not a thing of first importance. Baptism is a thing of first importance, but the question about mode and the age of those who come to be baptized, that's something on which Christians can disagree. There are lots of things like that on which Christians disagree, and we can argue, we can debate, but they ultimately are not things of first importance. And so the things we're looking at this week are actually far, far deeper. They're things where if we no longer agree on it, then actually one of us is wrong in a way that cuts us off from Jesus. That's what we're thinking about. We're battling for primary truths, things that Christians had to exclude as completely wrong. And and here's the other thing. We're also talking about, I guess, other religions. Of course, other religions, to the extent that they contradict what Jesus teaches, are wrong. But heretics aren't that either. The problem about heresy, the reason why these battles were so fierce, is that these were internal threats. These were people holding Bibles in their hands, saying, we as Christians want to tell you X. That made it a much, much greater danger. Because it meant that people had to wrestle from the scriptures with people who thought that they were Christians. But actually in so many ways, we're leading people away from Jesus. So that's our first fact to think about. These are battles for primary truths. Let's dig into the topic at hand today, which I've called creation, God, and everything else. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, from the very beginning, Christianity has always had a real emphasis on the goodness of creation. That's something we share with Judaism because of the Old Testament, which is in our Bibles and which for them is the Hebrew Bible. So from the very beginning, Christians have believed that creation is God's handiwork. It is a good thing from God. We are ourselves creatures. And actually, that came out of John 1. What were the very first words of John 1? 1? In the beginning. Where else do you hear that in the Bible? Genesis 1. Brilliant. Keswick crowd, you guys know. That, that's, that's the point that being made there is that John 1 is actually a fulfillment and continuation and climax of what's going on in Genesis 1. Christians have always believed that. So by starting his gospel in the beginning, John is saying the story I'm about to tell you about Jesus is the story of the fulfillment and redemption of God's creation. It's the story that begins in Genesis 1 coming to fruition in Jesus He, the word, is the one through whom all things were made. We heard that in the passage as well. He is the God who created all things, coming into his own creation so that he can redeem it and restore it, so that he can save it, if you like, from the inside. Now, I hope that all sounds really basic to you. But actually, in the ancient world, and particularly among the non-Jewish people that Christianity began to encounter, uh, pagan Greeks and, and Romans, That was very hard to stomach. Everything I just said about creation being the work of God, there only being one God, and creation being good, was really, really implausible. 
in the classical mind, creation was not actually particularly exciting or good. Lots of different philosophies and religious backgrounds abounded in that time. But many of them had, as a kind of shared belief, the idea that creation is not the most exciting thing going on. Physical reality, matter, it was not actually where the action was going to happen. It was very hard for people to believe in that. But before we really tackle their hang-ups, it's worth thinking about one of our hang-ups. Be honest, when you came to this seminar and heard it was about creation, what did you expect it would be about? So often when I talk to Christians about creation, and particularly about the battles around truth, we're all thinking about creation or evolution. We're all thinking billions and billions of years or not that long. A, a young earth and only a few thousand years. It seems impossible for us to even think about creation without going to that particular battleground. And the truth is that, I believe, is one of those areas where really godly Christians seem to disagree. I know very godly Christians who passionately believe things at one end of that spectrum and godly Christians who believe things at the other too. And I'm not planning on addressing any of that, so if you have any questions about that, I'm so not your person for that. I'm told, I'm told last year John Wyatt did some seminars and one of those dealt with it. So if you're here desperate to wrestle with creation and evolution, please go look up those talks. We're not thinking about that today. But can I say that, that actually if you're in that situation, then you really need to consider some of the things we're thinking about today. Because the truth is that the fact we can only think about creation versus evolution is a reflection of our own prejudices, but also how locked in we are to a very modern question. Obviously, the creation-evolution question only really gets going in the 19th century. The truth is, for most of Christian history, that was not the big question that people had when they thought about creation. They were thinking about something else. So there's a weakness in our understanding because we primarily think of creation as an event. It's something that happened, and we want to know when. We want to know how. Now, of course, creation was an event. We believe that. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Yes. But it's not just an event. Before anything else, creation is an action of God by which he makes and upholds all things. And so when we're thinking about creation, actually what we're talking about is a relationship between God the creator and everything else. The God who made everything and everything that he made. And this is really important to get. There is a clear distinction between the two. This is what so many of the battles we're about to think about were orbiting. Is God part of the creation he made? And Christians had to say, no, he isn't. They had to fight to defend an understanding of God that is separate from creation. Not separate because of hostility, but separate because he is not like the things he made. He is fundamentally different from his creation because he is its creator. So I just want to spend a little bit of time on that. Do we think about how different God is from creation and how good that is for creation? Think about it like this. God does not depend on creation, although all creation depends on him. He is not affected or changed by his creation. Although, of course, everything that happens in creation is a result of his will. He is never in competition with his creation. He has no rivals. He's never set up against creation. God never needs to take away from creation so that he can be more. He's not a black hole needing to suck things away in order to be great. He's like a fountain that never stops flowing with life and goodness for his world. His power, therefore, never limits creation so that he can be powerful. Rather, it empowers everything else so that it can be what he's called it to be. Now, this is going to be a little bit of hard work for us to think through. But what it means is that God does not share space with creation. He is not an object in the universe. Not a very far away object. He's not like that. He is not the biggest, best, and most thing in creation because he's not in creation. He is the creator who, to use the technical term, transcends it, goes beyond it, is not contained by it, even though his power contains the whole thing. 
He upholds it. He gives it coherence. What that means is that God is not limited by all of the categories that you and I think of as creatures instinctively. Those categories do not define him. Time and space, change, decay. None of these things can define God because he is the creator outside of time, therefore eternal, outside of space and therefore omnipresent, all of these different things. To give you another example, it belongs to created reality to be composite, to be made up of bits, divisible elements. To get really technical, not just the fact that you're made up of like physical atoms, that, but, but also the fact that you're made up of a soul and a body, a union of the invisible spiritual thing and a physical thing. So everything in creation is made up of stuff. But we deny that when it comes to God. He is not made up of anything. There are no bits in him that you could pull apart. He is entirely himself. His existence is the same as his essence. And if that is just too technical, don't worry about it. The point is he has fullness of life and there are no bits in him. As I said, I'm I'm, I'm part of the Church of England. And so I thought I'd quote some of the Church of England's doctrinal standards. And you may not know that it has doctrinal standards, but it does. And um, there's there's one of them called the 39 Articles, and it's it's on your quote sheet. One of the things that comes from that, and the very first one, is an understanding of who God is. And we get the definition that he is without body, parts, or passions. Great little summary of what God is like. You can't contain him physically, no body. He's not made up of stuff, no parts, and without passions. We could talk about this a lot in the Q&A, so come back to me if you have more questions about what that means. But what it means is that God is never acted on and changed by anyone else. His life is not contingent on what happens outside of him, right? Without bodies, parts, or pa- passions. What that means is God is not us but bigger. He's not you but more. He's other than you as your maker, which is so important to get our head around. How would it change your prayer life if you didn't think, I'm talking to basically me but bigger, but instead thought, no, I'm talking to the one who anchors reality and who can do more than I ask or imagine because he's not like me. So God is intimately involved with creation, but utterly different from it. And none of those differences make creation less. They make creation what it is. They mean that the goodness of creation flows from the goodness of God who made it and gives it wholeness and integrity and can do that because he's not an object in it. Just pause on this for a moment. I was having coffee with a friend um, a, a week ago and they were telling me how hard they find it to get their head around whether God really loves them. They made this point. They said, well, look, I, I know Jesus died for me, but surely he did that for God's glory, right? He, that's why God does anything, to glorify himself. And so if it's for God's glory then surely it doesn't, I have nothing to do with it. Surely it's not about me at all. Which I think is quite an understandable point of view. If, like my friend, you've, you've read you know, some of the books he's read, you're so amazed by the way God does things for his own glory that you might think, and sh- so I don't have a place in that. But I had to share with him that his mistake was that he was acting as if God and human beings shared space. As if the thing that God does for his own glory has to therefore, by definition, not be about us. That's not true. Because God is our creator, when he acts for his own glory, that is always for our good. Little biblical detour. First miracle, well, he doesn't call it a miracle. First sign Jesus does in John's gospel is in chapter two. And at the end of it, we read that um, this, the first of the signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, um, was to show his own glory. Now, just shout out, what was that miracle he did in Cana, Galilee? Water into wine. Isn't that fascinating? The thing that glorifies Jesus, that shows his glory, is a bunch of people with wine in their hands, wine that overflows, wine that is delicious. God's glory does not diminish you. When God acts for his own glory, it will always be for our good. Yes, it will cut across the sin, the idolatry, but it will always be for our good. We wouldn't know that if we had a wrong view of creation. If we thought that God shared space with us, then if he did something for his glory, then almost by definition, that means less for us. Not at all. His glory is always for our good. And in fact, we'll think about that again when we come to look at a really wonderful Christian called Irenaeus. We'll talk about him in a moment. Next slide, please. 
So going back to the early um, Christians, and particularly the first two and a bit centuries of the church, this was the prevailing classical view, that matter doesn't really matter. A lot of the heresies I'm about to talk about attacked the goodness and importance of creation. Now, like I say, that doesn't square with the Bible at all, that actually Genesis 1 tells you everything you need to know. John 1 says that that's what Christians believe God is redeeming. But it was attractive because there was a real squeamishness about physical reality in the ancient world. There was a sense that physical matter was just not at all as important, that the invisible bits of creation were much more valuable than the visible bits. And actually, I think, I think maybe you can understand the beauty of that. Anyone read Plato? Read Plato as he talks about things like logic and maths, and you start thinking to yourself, wow, that, that's really beautiful. It's easy for a moment to think, yes, uh, this, this invisible world of, of, of pure thought, maths, logic, surely that's where all the action is. And as a result, a family of heresies came up which just could not take John 1.14 seriously. The idea that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Now you might know that the word for word in John 1 is the Greek word logos. And we see that in lots of English words like biology or logic. Um, it, it, it's a word that we kind of throw around without really knowing it. And so when John is writing about the logos, he's using a word that the ancient philosophers, the Stoics, the pagan Greeks, talked about a lot. For them, the logos was the theory of everything, the, the, the undergirding rational principle of reality. And so if you imagine a pagan Greek person sitting there maybe, listening to John 1 as I read it, they would have loved the start of it probably. They'd have been like, yeah. In the beginning was the word. I believe in a logos, a theory of everything that explains everything. I, I believe that everything that was made was structured by that. They'd have been nodding furiously for the first few verses. But they would have been shaking their heads in disbelief by the time we got to verse 14. The idea that that logos is not just an impersonal theory of everything, but a personal God, that would have been a shock. But even worse, that that God who is above and beyond all things, chooses to step into his creation as part of his creation, they would have thought, no, that's insane. That's crazy. Why would you think that the God behind everything would sully himself with matter? And so actually, a lot of people struggle with the idea that Jesus came in flesh and blood. You'll see this if you look at 1 John, John's first letter. He talks about those who deny that Jesus came in the flesh. Do you know that? Um, so chapter 4, verse 2 is an example of that. That shows you, by the way, that as early as the first century, people were struggling to believe that Jesus was really God come in the flesh. Just because God and flesh don't have anything to do with each other, do they? That was what they thought. And so you had two equal and opposite errors. One which believed that Jesus was always just a human being, and he sort of got promoted, if you like, to being amazing and to being like God because he was so obedient. And that was called adoptionism, the idea that he was sort of adopted into a divine status. Yeah, but, but, but actually, Jesus himself, just a human being like you and me, that's all he ever was until God lifted him up, if you like. There was also, however, the sort of flip side of that, another error called deceitism, which comes from the word to seem. And the idea here is kind of the opposite one, that Jesus was never really human. He just looked human. He just seemed human. The truth is he was kind of some sort of spiritual being, but he never really made contact with creation. He was always kind of hovering just a little bit above the ground. And all of the physical stuff that we talk about, we talk about Jesus, you know, born in a manger, died on a cross, all of that was just a, an illusion. It just seemed like that stuff was happening. Because you see, if, if he was really God, then how could he be involved with the muck and mess of life? If matter doesn't really matter, if it's just a cosmic distraction from the things that count, the things of God, then how can you take an embodied Jesus seriously? And again, that was an early threat. You can see even in 1 John, he's cutting against that. I think you can recognize in some of Paul's letters, he's talking about, you know, Colossians 2, 9, that in Jesus, all the fullness of the deity dwells bodily. He's trying to make the point that the, these are wrong views. But these wrong views develop in the second century and the third into what we call Gnosticism. Now, that's with a G. Now, Gnosticism is a word that's thrown around really, I think, irresponsibly 
People don't use it in a very disciplined way. Christians of a certain ilk will call anything Gnostic. Um, But the reason why it's thrown around with so little discipline is that actually it was a really complex phenomenon. Very hard to describe what Gnosticism was. I want to call it a family of heresies that had a few shared traits, family resemblances, what we'll think about um, together. So, next slide, please. Let's look at one prominent error in the Gnostic family. And it's all about this guy called Marcion of Sinope, who's a charismatic teacher who was going around uh, churches, primarily in Rome. That's where he really took off. And he was disgusted by the Old Testament. In this, I think he had a lot of um, sympathy with other Gnostics, but he was particularly exercised by the Old Testament. He hated it. And he decided to become a Bible teacher by using the most powerful tools he had, a pair of scissors, and cutting up his Bible and taking out all the bits he didn't like. And to be honest, there wasn't a lot left by the time he was done with it. Got rid of the Old Testament, he absolutely hated that. Cut out most of the New Testament except for Luke and a little bit of Paul, and that was what he said was the true Bible. He believed that the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, was a different God from the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. They were different gods to him. And so the Old Testament was really a story of this terrible, maniacal Yahweh creating this world and therefore ruining reality. And that that was not the true God, not at all the father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wrote a work called The Antitheses, where he tried to show contradictions between the Old Testament and the New. Now, I hope even just mentioning that, you can realize this heresy is alive and kicking. It is so common to meet people who think the God of the Old Testament is different from the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So many people who think the Old Testament is basically bad news so that the New Testament can be good news. So many people who are fundamentally embarrassed by the Old Testament and the Old Testament God. Marcion's ghost is kicking around the church, perhaps even in our hearts as well. This is not a new threat. This has been going from almost the very beginning. Now, in Marcion's mind, you were saved from creation. And that means that the soul which listens to Marcion and learns his teaching can attain salvation, but your body will always be doomed. Your body is the bit of you that belongs to a fundamentally unworthy thing, physical creation. And so creation is something you are saved from. Eternal life is about escaping creation. If you want to be saved, get out of creation. So many Gnostics believe that. Marcion believed that too. And did you know Marcion was actually a sort of backhanded gift to the church because his pair of scissors in the Bible was so threatening to Christians that the earliest accounts we have of what books are actually in the Bible seem to have come up because of him. Because Christians had to say, no, you can't do that, Marcion. You can't get rid of that one. No, no, John's gospel is in the Bible. No, no, the Old Testament is in the Bible. They had to do that because Marcion came around saying they aren't. Just a little pause there. People often talk about, oh, the Bible was put together very late. And I don't think that's actually true. I just think we don't know what books were in the Bible from the very beginning because we didn't have to. That was the Bible. Christians went, yeah, this one was written by Matthew. Matthew's gospel, easy. We only start finding out when people start taking bits out of it. So when people say to you, oh, the books of the Bible, they were put together very late, hundreds of years, that's actually not true. No, rather, what's later is official recognition of the books that were already there. The the problem with Marcion, by the way, is that he's acting as if he's a Bible writer. The Bible writers, like Luke or Matthew, did go looking at other bits of the gospel, other eyewitness sources, and kind of make a collage, which becomes the gospel that you read. But they had the authority to do that, early Christians said, because they were eyewitnesses most of the time. They were dealing with eyewitness sources. So Christians said, what about you, Marcion? Where's your authority? Of course, he didn't have any. It was his own desire to get rid of the Old Testament gods and to cut down on creation. Next slide, please. Right, so Marcion and his little movement was really threatening and powerful. Lots of Christians opposed him and praise the Lord, he was basically kicked out. But like I say, he's representative of many other schools of Gnostic thought, and we call these uh, Gnostic He had an attitude to scripture that was kind of unique because he he hated the Old Testament. What you find is that other Gnostics basically used the Bible in a different way. They didn't all try to get rid of the Old Testament. Instead, they tried to promise a secret knowledge, and the word Gnosticism, Gnosis, means knowledge, that meant that you could read the Bible differently. We'll think about that in a little bit. 
Now, it's very hard to sum up Gnosticism fairly for a couple of reasons. Firstly, Gnosticism was secret. A lot of the Gnostics went to normal churches. That's been quite scary. Can you imagine, you go to church on a Sunday, and you don't know if the people in the pews, the people around you, belong to this incredibly scary, I guess you'd say, cult. The whole point of Gnosticism is that it was secret knowledge. And so people would go to church and look like real Christians, but have their Gnosticism going on under the surface. It's quite hard for us after many centuries to get to what they believed when so much of what they believed was secret. For another point, though, most of the time, for many centuries, we've only known about Gnosticism through the critics, through Christians who said, this is what Gnostics believe, and it's terrible. Uh, people like Hippolytus, people like Origen, people like Tertullian, and Irenaeus, who we'll look at again. And actually, it's quite interesting that for many centuries, people kind of thought, well, can we trust what these Christians are saying about Gnosticism? Maybe they just, you know, amped it up a bit, made it sound particularly stupid. Now, actually, in the 20th century, there was a, a collection of Gnostic writings found in Egypt at a place called Nag Hammadi. And what, what that discovery proved was that Gnosticism was absolutely as bonkers as all the Christians had been saying all along. Absolutely bonkers. Loads of crazy stuff, which we'll think about in a moment. Now, what we do know is that these Gnostic movements often took their names from their founders, names like Valentinus, Basileides, Corinthus, these powerful, charismatic figures who promised a mysterious revelation that would take people inside the truth of God. Yeah, you've got the Bible. Yeah, you go to church. Yeah, yeah, Jesus, this and that. But what if I could give you real knowledge? That's what they were saying. What if I could lead you into the truth beneath the surface? Leave those other sheep behind. Come and discover the real thing. That's what they were saying. And so as a result, sometimes the stuff they wrote pops up in the news. Have you heard of that? Hands up. Gnostic gospel. Have you heard that before? No, a few of you have. So it's every so often you get these accounts of Jesus' life or other texts. They're called the gospel of, and you know, gospel of Barnabas, gospel of Thomas, gospel of Mary. Um, and sometimes the newspapers will say things like, wow, look at this. Uncentered Christianity. The unvarnished truth. The thing the church suppressed all along. Now, in a way, when they do that, they're buying into Gnostic rhetoric. That's exactly what the Gnostics said themselves. We've got these Gospels. They're the actual truth. Now, the problem with the Gnostic argument is that all of them were written much later than the actual Bible. All of them. The very earliest one, which is called the Gospel of Thomas, might have some bits that go to the early second century. Maybe one or two that go back to the first century, but that's as early as it goes. All of the actual Gospels were written well before the end of the first century. So the reason why you don't believe in Gnostic Gospels and aren't reading them in church is just good history. These things were written hundreds of years later than Jesus. Why on earth would you take them seriously as historical sources? Now, if you ever do read these texts, which, you know, if you're ever really bored, you might want to, you'll find them bizarre. They will not look anything like the Bible books you've read before. And that's because the Gnostics did a really interesting thing with their own writings. What they did was they took words from the Bible, like the word word, logos, or God, or father, or light, or wisdom, Sophia, or fullness, pleroma. And they take all these words, which you will find in the Bible, but then they basically butchered them by creating a different mythology in which all of those things became characters. This means anything to you. They were basically writing terrible fan fiction of the Bible. And so what you'll find is that they're writing these things in which all of these characters are doing various bits. Some of them are making this bit of creation. The other one's making another one. They're all basically, though, saying that creation is the work of a divine power gone rogue. Salvation is the thing that happens when you are rescued from that. Now, in that understanding, creation is unstable. The physical world of bodies is the lowest rung of everything there could be. And salvation, again, is about escaping from it. Now, what do you make of that? If you were around, you'd say, hang on, none of this is in the Bible. How could you ever get any of that from the Bible? But again, that was the point. This was secret, hidden knowledge. Of course, you couldn't get it from the Bible. You needed to get it from these secret teachers. You needed to be initiated. Now, to one extent, these heresies were really plausible then, and to some extent still are today. Be honest, how many of us find life in our bodies a little bit of a drag? How many of us find as we get older that our bodies are enemies rather than friends, and we wish that they were better than they could be, and we find ourselves dealing with all sorts of things that don't feel as, as grand as they should? Changing nappies, colostomy bags, and you start thinking, 
the grossness of the body. How on earth could this matter to God? How on earth could this be a spiritual thing? How many of us would love to escape the mess and muck of being in a body, right? Add to that the idea that you could have secret knowledge. You could ignore what all the sheep are saying and, and go find the real truth. And you can see how this became quite a convincing cocktail to people in the ancient world. Perhaps even how it could be tempting today. Now, of course, after lockdown, I think we've all learned how awful it is when you're cut off from the bodily presence of other people, right? Isn't it amazing to be back at the convention and sitting next to each other? That's such a gift. But even so, I do think the instinct remains. Gnosticism as an institution is dead. It's gone. Thank the Lord. However, there are ways in which we are susceptible to the same errors about creation and denying its goodness. Just think about how central technology has become to us. Technology in itself is not evil, by the way. It can be put to very good use. But at the same time, just think about the impact it has on our lives. The internet of things. Storing your treasures in the cloud. All of these things, at their worst, can reflect an almost Gnostic tendency to think that real life doesn't happen in bodies anymore. It doesn't happen in meat space anymore, which is what some tech people might call it. There's a desire to transcend creation and to locate the, the goodness and significance of reality outside of the physical world. That's a threat for us, I think. And in that kind of world, with that kind of temptation, the most anti-Gnostic thing we can do, the most incarnational thing we can do, is to insist that bodies matter because God came to live in one. To insist on real water for baptisms, real bread and real wine for communion to insist on the bodily presence of other believers when we gather, to say that church on a screen, although it had to happen for a few months, has never been what ought to have been church, that the bodily presence of other believers is non-negotiable when it comes to enjoying the riches of God. Here's another takeaway. It means we can't just live on our favorite preacher that we download. Right? If we're Gnostics, that's all right. Get your MP3 from you know, John Piper or whatever, and that could be fine. But only if you're a Gnostic. If you believe in the goodness of creation, it matters that you hear the Bible opened up in the gathering of believers by a pastor who you can see and who can see you and knows you and you know them. That's an anti-Gnostic instinct. And as we close, I think we can respond and learn how to respond better by looking at how ancient Christians did. Can I have the next slide, please? Thinking, finally, about one of my favorite Christians in church history, a guy called Irenaeus of Lyon. He had a fascinating background. Um, he himself seems to have had a mysterious connection to the apostles. He, when he was very young, sat at the feet of a guy called Polycarp, who was a bishop of Smyrna, and Polycarp knew the apostle John. So for Irenaeus, this was not abstract, and he was so worked up by the Gnostic threats that he encountered. Others spoke about this heresy too. I mentioned some of them earlier. But Irenaeus is wonderfully helpful. We've got two works from him. A very short one um, called The Demonstration of the Apostolic Preaching and a massive one called Against the Heresies. Both of them are fascinating. Wish we could spend longer on him. We'll have time for questions in a bit. But let me share three ways, I've put them up there, that I think Irenaeus can be a huge blessing to us. Firstly, Irenaeus brings together creation and salvation when he's talking about the gospel. When Irenaeus does evangelism, he's always bringing together the truth that the God who created everything stepped into his creation in Jesus. It's not that creation happened there and then salvation happens here. They are one and the same work of one and the same God. And the fancy word for that is recapitulation. Um, the Greek, anakaphaliosis. The idea being that in Jesus, God recapitulates, gathers into one everything he's made, everything he's created, so that in Jesus, he can restore it. That means that Jesus can be everything Adam was made to be, but failed to be. Everything Israel was made to be, but failed to be. And therefore, this is the good bit, instead of salvation being from creation, salvation happens in creation and of creation because it happens in Jesus, the word made flesh. Let me read a slightly lengthy quote. It's, it's in your um, quotation handout as well. Arne says, the word has saved that which really was created, has saved humanity which had perished, effecting by means of himself the communion which should be held with it, i.e. reconnecting it to God, and seeking out its salvation. But the thing which had perished 
possessed flesh and blood. For the Lord taking the dust from the earth, this is Genesis 2, molded man. And it was upon his behalf that all the dispensation of the Lord took place. Jesus, he had themself, therefore, flesh and blood. Recapitulating in himself, not another, but the original handiwork of the Father, seeking out that thing which had perished. Do we get what Irenaeus is saying there? Yes, because we are flesh and blood creatures, Jesus had to be flesh and blood for us so that he could save us as we really are. Not just save our spiritual soul bits, but who we are, soul and body. And that means that salvation in Jesus is not a drastic plan B, creation, uh uh-oh, went wrong, uh, parachute Jesus in. No, Jesus is coming to save plan A. He is created, even as we are created, and through his resurrection becomes the new creation which one day all of us in him will be. To use a later slogan of the church, grace never destroys nature, it perfects it, it redeems it. Second thing, Irenaeus teaches us to be careful Bible readers. Spends a lot of time showing how the Gnostic heresies abuse the Bible. Talks about how Marcion mutilates and dismembers the Bible. And Irenaeus says we cannot do that. We have to make sense of the scripture as it's given. But here's one area where I think Irenaeus can really help us. He doesn't think that the best way to read Bible is to find isolated verses as kind of proof texts. He thinks that you've got to read it with a sense of the whole Bible story. He says you've got to know the mind of Scripture, the one story it's telling, and that story is the story of Jesus. He talks about how the Bible is like a mosaic made up of lots of different parts, arranged by God to show the image of the king, Jesus. But what false teaching always does is it rearranges the tiles to look like something else. RNA says a dog or a fox. And he says you've got to have the mind of scripture in your mind so that you can spot the wrong arrangement of scripture. And you can see when people are giving you less than Jesus. Isn't that a wonderful thing to believe? That we don't just take verses here and there out of context, but read the whole scriptures as telling us one story, the story of our king. Third, Irenaeus underlines the gift of the church, the gift of fellow believers and what they stood for. We can talk about this in Q&A. Some academics in the 20th century used to say that heresy was the first thing on the scene and right belief, orthodoxy, came later, was kind of imposed from above as some Christians got more powerful. We can talk about it in Q&A if you want to know more. And I don't want to deal too much with it now except to say this. Irenaeus, although enormously gifted, a brilliant theologian, never sees himself as doing creative work. He never sees himself as saying anything original. He makes a big deal about being an inheritor and guardian of what the churches have already received. Now, at one level, that's because of literal connections to the apostles. So Irenaeus can say, I come from the apostle John. So that guy who wrote those bits of the Bible, I've come from churches that came from him. That was an important link. But actually, even more important over time, was something he called the rule of faith. And the rule of faith, if you like, is a summary of the Bible, but a very short one that helps you read and understand the Bible. And it was a common inheritance from Jesus shared across lots of different cultures, languages, and territories. Let me read an example of one, and I think you'll recognize a bit of it from the creeds we say today. So, Irenaeus writes, The church, though dispersed throughout the whole world, even to the ends of the earth, has received from the apostles and their disciples this faith. In one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are in them. And in one Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who became incarnate for our salvation. And in the Holy Spirit, who proclaimed through the prophets the dispensations of God and the advents, the birth from a virgin, the passion, the resurrection from the dead, the ascension into heaven in the flesh of the beloved Christ Jesus, our Lord, and his manifestation from heaven in the glory of the Father to gather all things into one. A bit of that must sound familiar, mustn't it? Because the creeds we say week by week, or maybe you know, every so often in our churches, directly descend from these rule of faith. You can find versions of it in Irenaeus, in Tertullian, and some of the others we've written about. A common inheritance that Christians all over the place clung to tenaciously. And I think Irenaeus is a beautiful model of that. Going on a bit further in the same section, he says, as I've already observed, the church, having received this preaching and this faith, although scattered throughout the whole world, Yet, as if occupying but one house, carefully preserves it. She believes these points just as if she had but one soul and one and the same heart. I think Irenaeus Irenaeus would be delighted if he could be here and see people from different churches, different parts of the United Kingdom, perhaps different parts of the world, 
and think yes. Still, with one heart and one voice, the whole church proclaims this truth. Irenaeus, by tenaciously clinging to scripture and not seeking its meaning in secret knowledge, but in Jesus, challenges us to see salvation as a gloriously big thing. Because yes, your salvation is a wonderful individual reality. Yes, you will be in the presence of the Father if you trust in Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Yes, but it's not just you and Jesus. Wonderfully, it is an expansive, cosmos-embracing thing. Your salvation is part and parcel of the salvation of everything else in reality. And so in Jesus, your human nature, flesh and blood, body and soul, is joined to God who has inhabited those things in Jesus. And you will be made alive by the life of God. That doesn't circumvent your flesh and blood. That doesn't circumvent the muck and mess of being in a body. It will restore it as part of the renewal of all things. So, Irenaeus on creation. And I've given you some examples in the outline. Please do dig out more to see. Plenty more we could say. I want to leave time for questions. So why don't we draw a line there? And Stuart might have a microphone. And if you've got a question, please stick up a hand. That, great, good to see some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Liv. That was great. Um, I just had a, wondered if you'd make a few comments about environmentalism yeah. in the light of the distinct, distinctiveness of God from creation. How can we respond positively to environmental issues? Yeah. What perhaps do we need to be aware of and cautious of in terms of... Brilliant some of the prevailing worldviews yes. coming out Thank of you. And I'll do my best not to talk for ages on this. So one of the things that certain environmentalists have said is that Christianity is the problem because Christianity talks about a God who is outside of creation. And therefore, if we're always worshipping this God, then we won't care about creation. Clearly, they need to come to this seminar and read some Irenaeus. Because actually, if you believe in a God outside of creation, then the dignity of creation is a given. Nothing in creation makes it good. It's good already because it was made by God. And because he lasts forever, it's goodness is not something he will ever give up on. So that's a really important thing to be able to say to the environmentalists. But one of the flip sides of that is that some people within the you know, eco-theology world or whatever have basically said that in order to really talk about the environment, you almost have to believe in what's called pantheism. The idea that creation is God. To blur the boundaries between what God has made and who God is, and that's how we all respect it. So go look at a mountain, you're looking at God. Go look at a tree, you're looking at God. Wow, let's look after it. And actually I think the Bible says, no, no not at all. That's bad news in all sorts of ways, because okay, look at a lion savaging a deer, are you looking at God? Look look at a concentration camp, are you looking at God? After all, we are all creatures doing stuff. That's a real dead end. But the Bible does say, look at a mountain and you're seeing something that wants to tell you about God. If you read the Psalms, it's telling you, particularly Psalm 19, that there is a speech bubble you can imagine over every bit of creation saying, God is glorious, he is amazing, and it'll all point you to him. Irenaeus has some lovely stuff. He talks about trees. He says in the Garden of Eden, we became sinners through a tree, and so when Jesus died on the cross, we got saved through a tree. He talks about how even though God is the one who holds creation, on the cross, Jesus became so weak that creation held him as the cross held him up for display to everyone. Sorry, there's so much more to say, but when we have some of these basic things in place, we can talk to people about care, who care about the environment and say, If Jesus is Lord, there are even better reasons to care about the environment. There's even more reason to be hopeful for the environment. And this cause, which so grabs your heart, is actually not the most important thing in the world. Because of that, it has a dignity that's worth pursuing. Um, I did a talk on this to some students, and it was amazing how many people who weren't Christians, but loved the environment, came up to me and said, wow, we didn't think that Christianity would say that. So I think it's a real open door for the gospel. Thank you. Great question. Thank you very much. Will we get your slides with the questions? You absolutely can, if you want. Um, I think, because I don't know if I can send it via Keswick, I think the best thing to do is, if you come to me and tell me an email address, I'll make sure I send them over. Brilliant. Mine was also along the environment uh, thing, because I just felt so encouraged uh, at the high status you're giving to the whole of creation. Mm -hmm. However, I still find many Christians, evangelical Christians, have demoted creation without realising it and therefore think you've got to be green to be interested in climate change and the environment. For me, it is integral to the whole of being an evangelical Christian. So thank you for that. But could you please carry on saying to Christians, 
we're not just about saving souls. It is the whole of creation that God loves. Yeah. And it's the whole of creation that is groaning and waiting for salvation. Thank you. Thank so you. let's all as Christians take seriously climate change because particularly John 3.16, it says, for God so loved the cosmos, not the people, the cosmos. He loves his whole creation. Mm. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. The key thing is, let's be biblical. Let's say what the Bible says. And I think that will mean a a commitment to steward creation like we were created to to do. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, You mentioned about Irenaeus talking about how grace perfects nature. And that applies to the whole created order. Sorry, let me pause there. He never actually says okay. that. That's a later slogan that I think is a good summary of what he's saying. Okay. But ju- sorry, just because... Yeah. yeah, thank you. That's great. Thank you. Um, did he say, or does that tradition say anything about not just the created order in terms of things and our role in relation to the environment we just discussed, but in relation to human culture, what human beings do with creation... You know, yes. agriculture, architecture, engineering, and so on. Thank you. Because there is a, a strong tradition in the church which many evangelical Christians have lost, which is that actually God does care about us being involved in all those areas as yes. well in yes. order to bring the, the gospel to bear on those whole areas of human yes. culture, like, uh, you know, Bavink and Kuiper and that whole tradition. Yes, no, absolutely. Um, uh, if you're interested in that, there's a theologian called Oliver O'Donovan who talks about the moral order. So that when we talk about creation, we're not just talking about stuff, but as you say, we're talking about the things that come with creation, like culture making, like systems of authority. Like James Robinson was saying last night, he was talking about how, you know, what is talking about leadership and Jesus' authority, if not political? You can't put them in different boxes. So absolutely, grace perfecting nature does speak to that too. I think that's really good news. It means that when we open up our Bible, there is not a single thing we can think about in the world that could not be enriched and blessed by knowing Jesus. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a a beautiful poetry that your talk is in an old factory. So I think it really is hands-on there. Uh, Back to your Gnosticism, I was just wondering that uh, this current habit of occasional online marriages is a Gnostic temptation. Oh, certainly. And I think, so I, I, one of the privileges I have as a minister is conducting marriages. And one of the really interesting things is, you know, you take your right hand, your dad gives it to the, the person you're going to marry, okay, and then you take hold of the right hand. There's all sorts of stuff you do with the body. I will hold on to both right hands and say what God has joined together, let no one separate, doing that on Saturday for a couple. Because marriage is one of those things which is the union, not just of souls or identities, but of bodies as well. So absolutely, an online marriage, that, that, that is a sign that we've lost hold of something real about marriage. Um, yeah, absolutely. And you're right, doing it in this room is quite a funny thing. But at the same time, I was preaching at a church on Sunday, literally took two steps outside um, Crosswaite Church, all these amazing mountains. And you think to yourself, saying Psalm 121 is a different thing in Keswick. Because you literally can lift your eyes to some hills and ask yourself, where does your help come from? You know, my, my slightly scummy bit of Southampton, not so much beauty of creation to think about. But, of course, lots of creation order to think about. Lots of environmental realities there, too. Great question. Thank you. Any others? Go, go on there. Oh. Uh, on the uh, point of heresy... Um, Quite a, perhaps a difficult question, but um, there is one well-known person who was considered for a long time uh, an evangelical and uh, conference speaker, and that person is now said that he doesn't have a problem with um, homosexuality. You may know who I'm talking about. His favourite word is, is inclusion, and he he would include people. Or gay, not with a view for them changing. I wonder, do you have a view that if a person is naming the name of the Lord and at the same time holds a position that I would say is heret- heretical, how would, would she, would, should we treat and approach such a person? Not an easy question. Great, thank, thank you. Now, that isn't an easy question. I think we're helped here by, like what I said earlier, heresy is a technical term. It applies to a few things I've talked about, adoptionism, deceitism, and we'll, we'll mention many more through the week. And so in the case you're talking about, that person may not be a heretic on those areas of creation or trinity, but they are a false teacher because they're teaching against the truth. And so what I'd encourage you to see is, if you can imagine a Venn diagram, there's a big, horrible circle called false teaching, 
And heresy might be a subset within it. So that all false teaching is terrible. All false teaching will imperil salvation. All of it is to be avoided at all costs. But not all of it might be technically a heresy. Right, so that's just semantics. How should we treat people like that? Um, I mean, so just, I think one of the key places you want to go to on that is, is probably Jude, the book of Jude, which fulminates against false teaching as a really horrible, threatening thing, but then says this really fascinating bit. It, it says, um, Jude says, verse 22, be merciful to those who doubt, save others by snatching them from the fire, to others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. That's Jude 22 and 23. So you see there's a sense in which some people who teach falsely they're doubting and they need our mercy and we need to get alongside them and help them. With others, we need to snatch them from the fire with words that say, turn away from what you're doing. But with others, there's a sense of, well, not even others, but really mixed with fear, mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. The idea being that when we're trying to encourage false teachers to repent, we still have to remember that false teaching is the toxic thing it is. So it's a really good question. Um, and in the case you mentioned, I think I know who you're talking about, isn't it lamentable? Lord, have mercy on him. It is, it is shocking. And, and I think, you know, yeah, so, so impressive. But gifts beyond anything I could have. And I think what we just have to realize again is that gifts, platform, he says standing on a platform, none of these things are guarantees of faithfulness to Jesus. We need to trust him to keep us faithful. Thank you so much. I know there's a question over there. I'm so sorry, two questions. Can I say there'll be questions every time? I'll stick around for a bit afterwards now. Please come see me. But I think we need to finish now, don't we, Stuart? Um, same time tomorrow, same place, and don't forget, 11.15 this morning, the Bible reading in the main tent uh, with Alistair Begg. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.